Minute. It's exciting to see all of you every Sunday morning, right? To give each other a hug, to enjoy each other's fellowship. I always look forward to every single Sunday. Now, so uh, just now, Ji Chen talked about how he generated the picture of the cross using AI. And so I used ChatGPT and AI and Kiao to do a lesson on meeting Christ. And so he prepared today's lesson. <laughs> So if the lesson is not good, it's chat GPT's fault, okay? <laughs> and the lesson is good is because I spent some time correcting it, not much. That's, that's a lie, okay? That's a lie, okay? I did not use chat GPT, okay? Uh, for those of you who are not aware, it's uh, basically AI, right? Now you can write essays for you, you can uh, do a lot, a lot of different things, right? Basically, it's trying to imitate what human beings can do, and very often they do it even better. Right, than us human beings. Now, uh, but today we're not going to talk about AI imitating human. We're going to talk about us human beings imitating Christ. Amen. Now let's all go to God in the word of prayer first. Heavenly Father, God just really want to thank you so much that we can all come before you today as brothers and sisters, as your children to worship you. God, it is awesome that God we can sing songs in praise of you because God, you are worthy of all praises. God, you are awesome. God, you are mighty. And despite how incredible you are, you chose to love us. God, you chose to sacrifice for us, even though God, we are unworthy. God, we thank you so much, God, for your incredible love, God. And, and it is because of this love that right now, God, we can even have a chance to have a relationship with you. And Father, we pray that God, we can really learn to love you and honour you, not just with our lips in songs, not just in the things that we say, but also in the way we try to imitate you. Father, we pray that you be with us because God, it is not an easy journey. And God, I pray that God, you will be with me as well, God, as I share your word. God, so that God, together as a church, we can learn how to be like you. Thank you so much, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters, imitating Christ. Now, so um, a couple of months ago, right, I taught a lesson during midweek called the Church Part 1. And the three points in the lesson, one point was about leadership, the second point was about discipleship, and the third was about contribution. And while doing research, right, really preparing the lesson on discipleship, I read so many things that excited me. I thought, whoa, this is so much to, to squeeze into one point <laughs> out of three in a midweek lesson, right? I really want to go deeper into it, research into it, because it really excited me about what, uh, really learning anew what this discipleship is about, right? And today I thought I would share with you a little bit more about what I learned, not as three points anymore, but in one lesson itself. Now, what is a disciple? We are all very familiar with this Acts 11, 26 C. In fact, those of us who teach the Bible to others, right, we always use this. And we say, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And we say, Christians equal disciples. Disciples equal Christians. They are one and the same. And then we give a little bit more trivia. We say, guess how many times the word Christian appears in the Bible? Right? And then they say, oh, maybe 200 times, maybe 500 times. We say, no, only three times. Yes. Right? I say, because all the times, right, the Bible uses the word disciples. And whatever we learn, the Bible says, is what the disciples do, is what we as Christians should do as well. Isn't that what we teach people? And that is correct. Right? Christians and disciples, they are the same. And then Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, it says here, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we call ourselves disciples. We are called to make disciples. The word disciple or disciples appears 294 times in the New Testament, 
a few times in the Old Testament. But what is a disciple? We use that word all the time. We are disciples, we are disciples. Not just believers, not just Christians, we are disciples. But what really is a disciple? Right, the Greek term, I can't read Greek, but it's there, right? <laughs> refers to a student, a pupil, an apprentice, or an adherent. Now, we all know dictionary definitions. We read it and say, okay, yeah, sort of, technically, I know what it is, but really, what it is in practice. And what is it like? How did people in the past understand it? Now, what did the word disciple mean to the Jews back in the first century? Right? Because we know uh, the Bible right, was written 2,000 years ago. Right? How did the people back then understand the word disciple? How did the Jews especially at that time understand the word disciple? Now, let me give you a little bit of historical and cultural context of how it was like at that time. So back in Jewish society, back in those days, 2,000 years ago, from about 5 years old to 12 years old, okay, some scholars say from 4 years old, some scholars say from 6 years old, but there about that, right? Children went to the best sefer, which is like the primary school and the elementary school, right? Kindergarten and primary school combined together, roughly the age. And they were all taught on reading, writing, and memorizing the Torah. Now, what's the Torah? It's the first five books of what we have in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So for that many years, six, seven years, they were taught every single day on the Torah. How about the other books? No, no, just those five books. What do they do on Monday? Those five books. Tuesday, those five books. Wednesday, those five books. Thursday, those five books. And they memorize and memorize and memorize huge portions of the Torah. Imagine from kindergarten age to the age of 12, you are made to memorize, write, and read. So that they are all really familiar with what the Torah says. And then after that, the boy, not the girl, right? The boy will participate in his first Passover in Jerusalem after you've gone through that primary school PSLE, yeah? right? <laughs> then you can go to your first Passover in Jerusalem. So we remember reading the Bible, right? Jesus was at the temple and he asked very intelligent questions to the teachers. That's because it's been trained already. They are familiar, right? Of course, it's of course Jesus is special. Yeah, Jesus, of course, is special. But all the young kids at the time would have been trained. And that's why they could engage in conversations with the teachers. And of course, Jesus is different, right? He did it in a way that really amazed even all the other adults. Right? And then from 13 years onwards, there was no more formal education. Right? Uh, except after that, right, uh, in AD 70, we know there was a siege of Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed, everything. Then they started what's called the Beth Midrash, which is like a secondary school. But during Jesus' time, the Beth Midrash didn't exist yet. So that means from 13 years onwards, what would they do? The boys would learn the family trait. So that's when Jesus would learn to be a carpenter from his father Joseph, right? Apprenticeship, right? They all learn the family trait. And then the girls will help out at home. Now, but what if a person wants to continue studying, right? So before the Beth Midrash came about, the boys who want to carry on doing their studies, they would gather in a small group and carry on learning, or they would start study under a certain rabbi. And this would be the very, very top, top students, right? Because you can go to a rabbi and say, I want to be your student. And the rabbi can say, what's your PSLE score? <laughs> <laughs> How many A star? <laughs> right? The rabbi has a right to decide whether to pick you or not. And you want to go follow the best rabbi, and you want to follow the best rabbi, the best rabbi would have even higher expectations. So those who are not as good will not be taught by a rabbi. Okay, and, and so basically those who go to study under a certain rabbi, it means they leave their home to be with the rabbi, following the rabbi everywhere the rabbi goes. Now the student of the rabbi was called a Talmud, which is translated disciple. So that's where disciple comes about. 
you go to rabbi and follow him for the next, like what, probably 15 years of your life? Because you have to follow the rabbi until you are at least 30 years old. So imagine from 13 years old to 30 years old, you are taught under that rabbi. Now Paul was an example, right? In Acts chapter 22, right, we read that Paul was, went back to Jerusalem, right? He was preaching, he was arrested. And then after that, he asked to speak to the crowd. And when Paul spoke to the crowd, he says, hey, I'm from Tarsus. Right, he says, I'm trained under Gamaliel. And people, ooh, because Gamaliel, right, was a very, very well-known, very prominent rabbi, respected by all the Jews, respected by all the Pharisees, respected by all the teachers of the law. In fact, in, in Acts chapter 5, right, if you remember, the apostles, they were preaching, they were arrested, put in prison, somehow they got out of prison, and the next day went, went back preaching again, and they were arrested again, brought before the Sanhedrin, it was Gabriel who spoke up and said, hey, if what they do is from God, nothing we do can stop them. What, if what they do is not from God, it will just collapse anyway. Then they meant it's still on because it's from God, right? But Gabriel was one who stopped the Sanhedrin from executing Peter and the other apostles. Because Gabriel was influential. And Paul studied under Gabriel. So he left his home city in Tarsus around the age of 13, go all the way to Jerusalem and study under Gamaliel. That was what discipleship was about. And we see the same thing when Peter called, when James, sorry, James Peter, Jesus called Peter, James, <laughs> and John to be disciples. Right? He was walking along the coast. First he saw Peter and Andrew, Right, washing their nets, as they say, drop your nets, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they drop their nets and follow him. And we know for the next three and a half years, they followed Jesus everywhere he went. And as walking a little bit further down the coast, he saw another two brothers, James and John, and he said the same thing, and immediately they left their fishing boats and their fishing nets and followed him. That was what a disciple does. You drop everything and you follow your master or your teacher. That's how the Christians or the Jews at the time understood the word discipleship. Right? The first few years they were just learning, rote learning, memorizing, memorize, 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 memorize. But then when they have a master, a rabbi that they follow, a disciple, it's more than just memory work and Right? It meant a lot more. It means following the person. And so, there are a few different, of course, scholar articles that describes it. So what does it mean to live your life and follow? In what way do you follow? What does a rabbi do with the disciples? What do the disciples learn from the rabbi? Right? So, a few scholars studied that. They say here, one of them, the first one, rabbis were greatly respected. And to be a disciple of a famous rabbi was an honor. So Paul, eh? very high honor, right? So rabbis were expected not only to have vast knowledge about the Bible, but to show through their exemplary lives how to live by the scriptures. So it wasn't just a lot of head knowledge. It wasn't just, oh, I got PhDs in this, I got masters in that, I went to theology school. It's not just the knowledge but really living their lives according to the scriptures. So rabbis are not just recognized for their paper qualification, they're recognized for living it up. Right? And the disciples' goal was to gain the rabbi's knowledge, but even more importantly, to become like him in character. Not just to learn the knowledge right now, but to become like him in character. That's why it takes so long. That's why it takes so long. That's why it takes you living together with that person. Observing him. And looking at how can I change my character. <coughs> we all know how long it takes to change our character. Isn't it? Right? To learn something, memorize, okay. Not too difficult. Right? Primary school, that time quite easy. Now, 50 plus, very difficult to memorize. <laughs> 
right? But but comparatively, memorizing is much easier than changing our character, than modeling our lives after the person we are following. And that's what these disciples were supposed to do, not just learn. It's not just teaching and learning. It is, this is how I live out my life following the scriptures. And then this, the disciple, I'm going to learn how you live out your life following the scriptures. It's becoming like him in character. So it was expected that the disciple became mature. He would take the rabbi's teaching to the community, add his own understanding and raise up disciples of his own. And he does that when he's around 30 years old. Right? We know by 30 years old, Okay, uh, a person who is very diligent in studies that's at least a PhD, right? That's how much learning they really went through. Now in Judaism, second one, in Judaism in the days of the apostles, the job of the disciple was well understood. Okay, that means anyone heard from Jesus can't follow me and be my disciple, they all understood exactly what it means. Right now we are hey, what does it mean, huh? Oh, back in those days they all understood what it means. But a disciple's job was to become like his or her teacher. My job as a disciple is to become like my teacher. Right? At its simplest, discipleship is the art of imitation. It is the art of walking after a teacher. The third one, this level of discipleship implied that Talmi or disciple imitates his rabbi, honors him and follows wherever he goes. But that relationship also implied master-disciple relationship where Talmud acted as a servant to his rabbi. So we see again and again and again, what is a disciple? Someone who becomes like the rabbi. Someone who imitates his rabbi. That's what a disciple is. Right, and we go back to the scriptures again, Luke chapter 6. It says here, the student is not above the teacher. But everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. You become like your teacher. What the scripture says is the same as what we read in a historical context. Right? This is what people in the first century understood it to mean. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now for Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 11, when it says follow the example, right? we know uh, these are from the NID. Right, the, the version that most of us use quite often. Now, but in a lot of other versions, in fact, in many other versions, the word that they use instead of follow the example is imitate. Imitate. Or be an imitator. So we always say Christian equals disciple. Right now we see disciple equals imitator. A Christian is an imitator of Christ. A disciple is an imitator of Christ. That's what we are supposed to be doing. That's what all of us are supposed to, to do in our lives. Right? And, and so, understanding this, I think there are different misconceptions that we need to clear. Right? How we've always defined disciples, how we've always defined discipleship, how we help each other to become disciples. Those misconceptions have to be cleared and we need to change how we do things. So what is a Christian? A Christian is not just a believer of Christ, but an imitator of Christ. And what is Christianity then? Christianity is not just a religion or a belief system, but Christian, Christianity is a life of learning to be like Christ. It's a life we have chosen. It's a journey that we have embarked on. We want to learn to be like Christ. So what is church? Church is not a counseling center or community center. The last time I preached this, someone wrote in a campaign. <laughs> but it is true. It's not a counseling center. It is not a community center. Neither is it an English language center. Because I heard people say, hey, go church, learn English. 
<laughs> like back in those days, right, in all days when people were not trying English, in the church is preach in English, read the Bible in English, and learn English, right? And then army, I've been like, invited people to church before, right? I said, hey, oh, your church got pretty girls or not? <laughs> right? Church is uh, back then no Tinder, right? So they go to church to look for pretty girls. <laughs> no, church is not all of that. Okay, not counseling centre, not community centre, not English language centre, not a place to find your other half. Though, if you get your emotional and psychological, met, psychological needs met in church, amen. Awesome. Though, if you find friends in church, amen. Awesome. If your English gets better in church, amen. Awesome. If you find your spouse in church, amen. Awesome. But that's not what church is supposed to be. Right? You get some of the other needs met. Awesome. Really happy for you. Really happy for all of us. I found my wife in church. I didn't come to church looking for a wife. Okay? <laughs> but I did find my wife in church. Right? Now, but a church is a family of Christ imitators. And what is discipleship? This is where we really need a major shift of mindset. Right? Discipleship is not defined by our commitment to attendances. It's not defined by the amount of contribution that we give. It's not defined by how often we evangelize, how many people we help become Christians. Discipleship is not defined by all of this. Not in our immaturity, you know, we have done that before, right? In my immaturity, that's what I've done previously too. I find ways to measure my discipleship. Am I good enough? Am I righteous enough in the eyes of God? Do I meet up to the standards of God? Do I meet up to the standards of the church? Sometimes it comes from wrong teaching. There's tendency for us to want to blame wrong teaching. But a lot of times it comes from our own hearts as well. It comes from our own insecurity. I, I know I struggle with this because of my insecurity. I struggle with insecurity. I struggle with self-love. Right? And, and, and I have to find ways to measure up. Okay, I, I, let me do this, let me do that, let me do this, let me do that, let me evangelize harder, let me pray longer, let me read more of the Bible. Let me make sure I attend every single Sunday service and not just that the midweek service, not just that the Bible talks. Let me do all of the above so that I can feel secure that I'm a good person, that I'm worth Jesus Christ the sacrifice, that I'm worth God's love. Because I struggled with self-worth, because I struggled with insecurity, I did a lot of this to feel better about myself. But it didn't just stop there. Sometimes I became very humanistic. It's not just to feel better about myself. It's also to make sure my leaders are happy with me. Again, because of my insecurity, I wanted to be accepted. And, and so, I measured discipleship by my commitment to all of those different things. Right? Now, is we, of course, after that mature, and before we mature, okay, these are wrong things that we do. Right? And these were wrong things that I do because after trying to do things to prove my worth to God, to prove my worth to men, after a time it came to show off. Because pride got into me. I go egoistic. This is to prove that I'm better than the other people. The other people don't come to church that often. I come to church more often than them. I help more people become Christians than them. I spend more hours teaching the Bible than them. I help more poor Christians than them. To insecurity, somehow, to pleasing men, somehow to feeding my own pride. In many different ways, we define discipleship wrongly, not just because of the teachings which we like to blame on, and sometimes, yes, teachings play a very big part, but a lot of times because of our own insecurity, because of our own man-pleasing attitude, and also because of our pride. 
See, we need to really look at what discipleship really means. It is not really trying to meet up to standards. It is leaving our nets behind and desire to become more and more like Jesus. And what is righteousness? Righteousness is not a rule, uh, not a list of rules and laws, not a list of do's and don'ts, but it is a desire. It is our daily pursuit to be holy like Jesus. And we like to sometimes use this catchphrase, right? In certain situations, think, what would Jesus do? Right? Oh, I'm faced with this situation. I don't know what to do. Let me think. What would Jesus do? And I think that's good. Okay? That's one good step. One very good step. Let's think of what would Jesus do? Not just what would my disciple do. Not just what would my leader do. Not just what was I taught to do. What would my mommy say? What would my disciple say? What would my leader say? But what would Jesus do? That's awesome. Let's think that way. But let's bring it a step further. Not just what would Jesus do, but what was Jesus like? Jesus' character. A person with this character, how would he behave in those circumstances? Not just Jesus' actions, but Jesus' characters leading up to those actions. Because our goal is not just to imitate the action, our goal is to become like Jesus. So let's think about what would Jesus do, but let's think deeper than that. What was Jesus like? So that we not only imitate his actions, but we imitate his character. We become like Jesus. That's what the Bible calls us to do. And when we talk about imitating Christ, okay, well, there's all the theoretical things about, right? What the scholars say, what history books say, right? What theology says, right? But, but really, what does it mean? What does it mean? The past earlier, very easy to learn, right? Disciple, Christian equal disciple equals imitator, right? Very easy. Why do we even need to spend so much time on that? This is the hard part. Mm, come on. This is the hard part. The theory part is easy. Imitating Christ. And I listed here just two things which I think are very hard. Sacrificial love, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. We read that scripture before, uh, just now, actually, right? It says, follow God's example. Therefore, as daily love children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Now we focus on this part of the scripture. Sacrificial love. It says he was supposed to imitate this example. Where it says, just as Christ loved us. That's what just as, meaning, follow that. It's not an option. It is not, it is good to. This is what we are supposed to imitate. Sacrificial love. Love, can love. Giving, can love. Sacrificial love, that's hard. Can, can we stick to just lovey dovey, send each other cards? Can we just switch? Uh, okay, keep, keep, stick to encourage one another. That one I can do. Encourage one another. Can, can, can. Just need to, you know, be nicer with my words. But sacrificial love? Is this what we strive to imitate? Now, this is unlike the world. But we are not supposed to be like the world anyway. Right? In the world, we we'll sacrifice probably okay for children, like for wife, for husband, for parents. Okay, that one day hey, reach the peak already. Ah, don't ask for more already. Ah. <laughs> but sacrificial love. That's what we are supposed to imitate. Now we are very willing to talk about love, but we are not very willing to talk about sacrificial love. Are we willing to sacrifice for each other? Let's not talk about dying for each other yet. <laughs> sacrificing our time, sacrificing our money, sacrificing our convenience, putting our interests a little bit further behind so that other interests, other people's interests can come before us. Sacrificial love. 
let's strive towards that. I want to confess this is not my strength. And this is what I want to change in. I want to encourage all of us, church, to work towards that, to imitate Christ in his sacrificial love. Humility and servanthood. In Jinkaru, you pick all the hardest ones. Huh? <laughs> because the easiest one, no problem, right? <laughs> Humility and servanthood. John chapter 13, verse 12 to verse 15. It says here, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. What Jesus flex here, did I? Yes, I am Lord and I am teacher. Correct. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you, should, you also should wash one another's feet. I set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Verse 15, huh? quite obvious, right? Does it sound like an option? I set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus was flexing that, yes, I'm the Lord, yes, I'm the teacher, but look what I've done for you. Yes, I'm higher rank than you, but look what I've done for you. Humility, servanthood. Now, this is a hard teaching. Really, in the world, we are taught that, okay, the higher up, the more privileges. The higher up, the more you get served, right? Got PA, like, got secretary, like, got deputy vice president, so everything under you, right? And then you got a whole lot of stuff under you, or you got servants at home, or you got people to help you. The higher up you go, the more people to serve you. Right? And we learned just now that a teacher, right, has the disciples serving them, right? What we saw just now. And Jesus turns it around. He says, hey, let's turn it around. This is not my way. That's the worst way. I'm your teacher. I'm your Lord. I wash your feet. I'm humble. I will serve you. Now it's easy for us to take this. Ah, you see? That's what leaders should be. Yes, that's what leaders should be. But that's what all of us should be. It applies to the leaders definitely. And it applies to all of us. Let's be humble. Let's serve one another. These are two very difficult ones, but there's a lot more about imitating Christ. How about imitating Christ in his obedience to God? Imitating in Christ in his trust towards God. Imitating Christ in his righteousness. In his love for the poor. In his forgiveness and grace. In his compassion. In his love for the world. What area are you strong in? What area are you weak in? Right, some ask, oh, I'm going to be in righteousness. I'm going to demand righteousness out of everyone. Okay, yes, yes, amen. Let's try to be righteous. But it's more than just that. Really, in which area are you strong in? In which area are you weak in? In which area do you want to strive? to imitate Christ. Okay? I look at this list, I thought, okay, let me go back to God. Okay, many, many more things for me to grow in. But that's what we should strive to us. Let's imitate Christ. Not to fix our self-worth, not to please people, not to have a, please our ego, right? To prove ourselves better than others. But really, so that we can become disciples of Christ. Right, and we do really need each other's help in this. Okay, we look at the list with the whole so hard. Lah. How? Okay, well, that's why we need each other. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. When one says, I follow Paul, and another, another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So Paul actually wrote this to the church in Corinth because they were divided. 
different people say, hey, I follow this leader. No, 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 I follow that leader. And some say, hey, I follow Paul. Paul didn't say, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good choice, you all follow me. Yeah, follow Apollos, terrible. And then when he says, hey, it's not about Apollos. It's not about Paul. Yes, we do our part, but it is God. <coughs> Paul says, it's not us, the leaders. It's all about God. We should not become followers or disciples of one another. We should become disciples of Christ. But we all used to, oh, oh, oh this is my disciple, referring to a human being, right? This is my leader, this is my disciple. I, I try to imitate him or her. No, 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 no. We are not disciples of each other. We are not followers of each other. We are supposed to be disciples of Christ. Our goal is not to imitate a human disciple, a human leader, a human rabbi. Our goal is to imitate Christ. But we used to at one point become very obsessed, let me imitate my disciple. Okay, I remember in the old, old days, right? Bible, Philofax, okay? And then up in the scripts, right? All of us have a similar looking kind of Philofax. Hey, hey leader, Philofax, one Philofax. Leader, a pager, we are a pager. Right? We, we emitted a lot of physical actions that people do, and bless our hearts, we, we really wanted to do what's right, but we set our eyes, our focus on imitating human beings. But Paul says, yeah, hey, hey, it's not about us. Right? Because putting too much emphasis on human leaders divides the church. That's what was happening back at that time. We say, no, no, we want to pull up. No, no, we want to pull up. Hum emphasis on human leaders divides the church. We've seen that happen. It leads us away from Jesus, from God, from the Holy Spirit. Because we are looking at the human beings. This leader has done so much for me. When I was down, he encouraged me. We were struggling with my marriage, he helped me. When I needed someone to be beside me, he was beside me. And we turn our focus on these human leaders and forget about God. And Paul says, hey, we only planted the seed, we only watered it. God makes it grow. In the end, it is about God. Right? And if we follow human leaders, we get disappointed eventually. Because the fact is this, human beings will fail us. We're all fallible. We're all very fallible. Right? And, and we have seen that happen to ourselves. Right? I remember at one point when I was less mature as a Christian, I got so frustrated with myself. Right? Because I want to change certain things. And then our New Year resolution. I'm going to change it in this area. January is good, February is good, March, oh, psh, gone. Or sometimes, cannot even tahan too much. January is good, February, fail already. Oh, Chinese New Year resolution. <laughs> Luckily, Chinese, you got one more New Year, right? <laughs> Set new resolutions. Fail. Then, okay, okay, okay. May, my birthday, take note. <laughs> May! Birthday wish. Yeah. Let me wish what I did. God, please help me change in this area. I feel. And then after that, spiritual birthday. June. God, my spiritual birthday, I really want to change in this area. Help me. And after that, I feel again. Right? I try as hard as I want to. I sometimes pray, I sometimes fast, I sometimes ask people to keep me accountable. But I fail all the time. I want to keep trying. I don't want to ever give up trying. And hope after years of trying, I get better and better. But all of this experience only shows that I, I have a fear that I fail all the time. We human beings are fallible. And yet we dare to tell people, hey, you're my disciple, you better follow me. Something is wrong there, isn't it? I knew how much I, I failed. I knew all the promises I made, all the resolutions I made, I tell people, hey, you follow me. Instead of turning people to Christ. Say, hey, let's follow Christ. This is Christ's example. Human beings will disappoint us. We will disappoint one another. 
we should become followers of Christ. You know, many leaders, they shepherd people to themselves instead of God. And I really appreciate Paul over here. Paul, that super apostle that he was, planting churches all over the place, so many things that he did, and he did them all well. He said, hey, 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 no, 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 no. I just plant seed only. He pointed back to God. And that's what every leader should be doing. Right? That's what every leader, disciple, big leader, small leader, high rank, small rank, whatever rank, <laughs> no rank, anyone who's helping another person, officially or unofficially, we should be pointing people towards God. Amen. But sometimes we don't because of ego. Many times we don't start off that way. Okay, very often we don't start off that way. Very often we start with really noble intentions. I just really want to help that person. But to help the person, the person, oh, thank you so much. You really impacted my life. Then you think, wow, you're quite good, eh? And then you help another person, the person, oh, you are awesome. Oh, yeah, actually, I'm awesome. Then another person, wow, because of you, uh, that's why my family get impacted. Oh, now I not just help the person, I help the family. And then different things add up. It adds up and adds up. From a noble intention, we start getting egoistic. We get proud. As we get more and more respect from people, more and more people listening to us, hey bro, I got, I got to ask you for advice. And who are this person so sharp still ask me for advice? Then I must be someone. Lah. Okay, I can talk about this. So it's because this were really thoughts that crossed my mind before. I am guilty of a lot of this. I struggled with pride so much at different points when I left. Ego gets to us. Satan wants to corrupt every noble motive that we can have. So that even though we set out good intentions, we can stray away. I appreciate Paul pointing the people back to God. Mm. And sometimes leaders shepherd people away from God towards themselves because of personal gain. It can be financial, it can be power, it can be self-interest. Sometimes it's not money. Sometimes it's not ego. Sometimes it's self-interest. If I lead, I get people to follow me, I'm easier. Because what well, then? At least what I want is back. Right? Self-interest. We want things our own way. For small, small little gains. Sometimes not big gains, but for small little gains. So that things go our way. Right? So now, so we talk about oh, uh, like that, don't help one another already. La. Leader, uh, human beings are so terrible, right? <laughs> that's why we help one another. Now, we just want to establish this first, right? Not to discourage us from helping one another, but to really see what is the right way of helping one another. First Corinthians chapter 11. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. We saw this passage earlier, but I bring it up here again. Paul said this. Follow my example, I'll imitate me as I imitate Christ. That means if my leader don't imitate Christ, then don't. Oh, but my leader tells me uh, I should dress like him. Yeah, because back then they said such things before. <laughs> no. Because that has got nothing to do with imitating Christ. My leader says when I talk to people, uh, when I evangelize, I must talk to him in a certain way. Well, do we know how Jesus evangelized exactly? Okay. Well, he spoke in Hebrew. Right back, okay, la, then, then speak Hebrew. La. Okay, it's not about this past. It's not imitating small little things. It's really following the character. Right? We follow each other. Because sometimes human examples are helpful. Human examples are helpful. Right? Our goal is to be Christ-like. And so we need to see not just okay, how did Jesus did it, but sometimes seeing in each other. And it's not hard to see in each other. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit, right? Just as sin, uh, the fruits of sinful nature are obvious, the fruit of the Spirit is obvious too. The Bible lists all of it. And we can see in people's lives. Your person shows real humility. Your person shows real love. Your person shows real patience, kindness, compassion, grace, forgiveness, courage. 
this are easy to see in people. Because if they have it, it's obvious. And if they don't have it, it's very obvious too. Right? And having these examples of people who, who can imitate Christ inspires us and encourages us. Okay, that means I can also. Seeing examples of people change, their lives transformed. And Paul was very transformed, wasn't he? Yeah. Right? A persecutor of Christians, putting them in prison, putting them to death, became the most courageous guy who goes around preaching and setting up churches. Having examples on earth encourages us and inspires us. Now, it doesn't mean that they become the rule or the benchmark. Okay? It doesn't mean, oh, my leader do this, that means I do this. They, don't, they are not the rule or the benchmark. They are an example for us to learn from, to be inspired by. Because the end, in the end, what we really want is to imitate Christ. Okay, can also help one another by encouraging and building up one another. The third, Thessalonians 5. Confessing our sins and praying for one another. Do we still have people whom we can confess our sins to? Right? That's something that I think a lot of us have lost. That's something I've lost. How often do I confess my sins to people now? Right? And of course, praying for one another after we confess one another to another. Right? Remember something that used to be good. Right, brothers getting together, confess their sins to one another, and then pray together for one another. I think we should go back to doing that. Spurring one another towards love and good deeds. Now the question is this, do you have someone to help you? Getting hey, what well, I used to have a group that I was really part of, that I could do that with. But right now, you know, because of situations, I don't really have that group yet uh, anymore. I don't really have people I can learn. Find someone. Yeah. Right? First, find someone who can teach you the Bible and guide you. For those of you who really want to know more about the Bible, find someone to teach you and guide you. And then to build closer relationships with one another. That's what we need. Right? We don't need disciples or leaders who are assigned to us. Okay, from now on, this person is your disciple. This person is your disciple. Okay, go. <laughs> Start cranking. Okay, our favorite word last time. Cranking, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. But I don't even know this guy. I have no relationship with this guy. Now I have to confess my sin to him. Okay, well, let's build the relationship so that confession becomes natural. It doesn't become something we have to do, but because I'm close to him, I want to tell him my sins. Because I'm close to him, I want to pray with him. Because I'm close to him, encouraging one another becomes natural, not big deal, right? Not because we have to, right? Okay, now, the good thing about having an assigned group, an assigned disciple or disciple, or whatever we call it, is that, well, at least we have someone, uh, but the thing is, sometimes it has an adverse effect. We think, oh, then this is the only person I need to build relationship. No. We build our relationship with as many people as possible. We get as close to as many people as possible. And we encourage and exhort each other as much as possible. Not just to restrict ourselves to one. It's to make sure we have at least one. But the problem with assigning disciple or leader, or whatever we call it, is that a lot of times it's not even based on who we're close with. Right, so what to do? Right? Okay. Now, uh, you want to assign care line. Okay, but I think the better way is let us build close relationships again. I know for some of us, right, we, okay, well, well, what's my group now? What group do I belong to? I want to encourage us. Find a bunch of brothers and sisters you're close to and form up. Meet up. Talk about God. Pray together. If I how, uh, can you appoint a leader among us? You want to appoint yourself? Uh? Right? Or what? What if there's no leader? Yeah. Right. Because what we want to do is to imitate Christ, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All we need is someone to question, hey, let's meet together and let's, let's pray together. Yeah. Right? We don't need a leader who says, okay, we need to pray of A, B, C, D, E, let's do this, do that, do this, do that. Now, come on. I think all of us have the Holy Spirit. All of all us have the desire to follow Christ. And I think if we get together, we can naturally help each other to glorify God. Amen. Amen. 
right? So find people you're close to and start forming up groups. Now, I think it's awesome that we can get together as a church, right? But then, church, normally like that, we notice it's quite one way, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Maybe one day we should try it. Ooh, super interactive, right? <laughs> uh, but, but really, no matter what, there's still a lot more one way. Yeah. With your groups, it's where you can get a lot more interactive. Okay, where besides lectures, you can have tutorials, okay? Just to use terms that students like, right? And you can do presentations, yeah. okay? So, uh, this school got to do all this, and church also got to do all this. <laughs> no, really, right? Because having a group of brothers and sisters who understand us, know us more deeply, where we can pour out our hearts, where we can call each other higher, is a lot, a lot more effective than this one-way thing that we have. So I really want to encourage us, let's start forming up groups. Now, there's no accountability to make sure you have a group. Yeah. There's no list, hey, how come you got no group? Actually, you don't fit this group, you should join that group, because this group, <laughs> form your own, and build love among one another. Hey, but what if I like this group, I also like this group? Join both. Join both. <laughs> join both. La. Right? What if I'm introvert? I really don't want to be part of any group. No, no one's going to force you. Seriously, no one's going to force you, right? But you will find it a lot more beneficial. Right? And maybe a bunch of introverts can get together. Hey, let's all be introverts together. <laughs> no, and really, there, there are things that introverts can do together, right? Quiet time. Quiet time. <laughs> Literally. No, it, you know, but we all, we all need not much of a talker, right? You can't talk, I can't talk, we all get together to know what to do. How about just getting together to pray? I think that's awesome. How about just getting together to read the Bible? If I read Bible after that, I must share inside or not. If you don't share inside, don't no, no. Even reading the Bible together, I think it's awesome. Right? But we're trying to think, oh, read Bible, must share inside. Inside must be awesome. If inside not awesome, then what? Like, I lose my people not so impressed with me. Put all of that aside. What we really want to do is become brothers and sisters who want to help one another be like Christ. What if I do not know what advice to give to the other person? I think advice is overrated. Okay, I'm not saying advice is bad. Huh? The Bible does say it's good to get advice. But human advice is overrated. We put too much emphasis on that. Note, it is good. Okay, I'm not saying this, but it is good to have advice. But we overrate it. We overrate it. Sometimes that human advice well, can almost compare to God's law. Okay, that's where it is wrong. Okay, even just sharing, even if you can teach someone, sharing what you went through is helpful. Yeah. Or even saying, I'll pray for you and mean it. Not just I pray for you and then go back and forget. I'll pray for you. That's awesome. And sometimes it's not even just teaching and telling each other. Sometimes it's doing it together. We like to give advice. Bro, you better pray more. Don't just tell a person, bro, we will pray more. See, let's pray together now. Yeah. Now let's meet again one week later and pray together again. Not just, bro, you better fast about this. Hey, bro, why not I fast together with you? Yeah. Let's set this day. We fast together. Right? It's not just teaching, it's doing things together. And that's what the rabbi and their students did. The rabbis and disciples, they did things together. We see in the Bible, that's what Jesus did. He went around, his disciples followed him. He did things, his disciples imitated what he did. It's really walking with one another. So brothers and sisters, I really want to encourage all of us to walk with one another. Right? Let's form up relationships with one or two people, three or four people, five or six people. Let's form up groups as well so that we can help one another to imitate Christ. Amen. Right? So that's all I have to share. Amen. Thank you. I just want to share a bit on, on uh, Kinder's lesson. 
uh, before the service actually we were talking about things and you know it seems like we are all experienced as last to, to, to read certain things and I think this lesson is very good today on imitation of Christ. You know, but I just want to address something because imitation is not a good word to some people. Right? Imitation seems to say that we are not original, which is very important to a lot of people now. <laughs> you are not original. Basically, you are fake good, right? You are fake good. You know? Original copy. Right? So, uh, and a lot of us are brought up that we got to be our own man, our own woman, you know, we, we, we need to. It doesn't mean that we give that up. But I think it's important. But you know the funny thing about all these people is who want to be original, right? Yet, uh, you see so many people follow the K-pop star, uh, how they dress, uh, follow a lot of, uh, follow your boss, how they talk. Actually, we imitate more than we think. We think that we do. So I think the important about imitating somebody is that you need to be really impressed and adore that person you want to imitate. You know, so I think that is something that, you know, whatever Jikai has shared, we have to go back to what, who is Jesus? Yeah. You know, what what are you so impressed that you want to imitate? What 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 do you want to imitate, right? Yeah. Because once he, if he's your hero and he's your idol, then it's easy. Yeah, you will just follow. You know, so I think that's that's something for me to I mean, not that I am like that, I just you know, I was thinking <laughs> about that as as you're preaching that there's a lot, definitely a lot of things for me to learn, you know, but I think that's that's something I hope all of us can think. How is Jesus like? How can I adore Jesus more than my K-pop star, more than whoever you adore? Lah. Okay? I think that's something we need to look at. Can I have the announcements like this? So the announcement is very simple. Okay. Uh, on next week, uh, there's a midweek. On Thursday night, it'll just be a prayer night via Zoom. Okay, 8 p.m. We'll give the Zoom Zoom uh, Zoom link. Okay, we'll pray there. Uh, next Sunday, please note it's still 10 a.m. But but it's on level four. If you come here, it's empty. Yeah? Or maybe you maybe you meet another group. Uh, okay? but level four. Okay, next week level four canary room. Okay, so that's all for our announcement. Uh, we can enjoy a good time of uh, knowing one another. Okay, amen.